Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm here to speak with you about introducing computer science students to open source. Um, I'll take a moment to mention my open source projects. I wrote the software for the sisters email list, female computer scientists run by anitab.org. While at Google, I worked on App Inventor and the open source port of it to MIT where I've continued to contribute. Also at Google, I worked on Blockly, including the uh, first hour of code, which was based on it. I found um, working on open source very satisfying and exciting and wanted to share that experience with my students. I teach at Mills College, which is a minority serving women's college with co-ed graduate programs in the San Francisco Bay Area. Our students, like me, tend to be idealistic and want to make the world a better place, which is one of the reasons that open source appeals to us. We have, Mills has a unique graduate program for students with a bachelor's degree in another field who want to transition into computer science. Many of our classes are dual level with undergraduates and graduate students, and I need to provide additional material to graduate students. In programming project courses, I've been having the grad students contribute to open source projects. I'll now say a little about the skills and tools that students need. The number one skill is command line usage. It's rare for students to have experience with the command line, so I have them work through tutorials. I have Windows users install Git for Windows, which includes Git Bash. Of course, students need to be able to use Git and GitHub. The workflow I teach is a little different from the standard one. Instead of directly forking the repository of the project that students are contributing to, I have a class repository so they can push their code there for review by me before making a pull request on the project repository. Students may be reluctant to communicate with strangers online, especially if they're concerned that they might face racism or sexism, which are valid worries, um, but hasn't been the experience of my students, fortunately. I have students, I help students make their first post to Stack Overflow, communicate with developers on Discord, post to GitHub, and write proposals for complex changes. I solicited past students experiences when uh, creating this talk. One element, um, here's what one said. One element of the class that I appreciated was a consideration of communication and community. As you encouraged me to write a stack overflow on my build problems, you also stressed the importance of good etiquette in posting complete and useful information to make things as easy as possible for any friendly person who would take time out of their day to answer. We also discussed the importance of respectful community in open source projects. I try to keep these lessons in mind today when I communicate with my collaborators. The imposter syndrome is real and always present. You need to encourage students to have a growth mindset. It's not enough to mention it once. Every day, you should communicate to students that you make mistakes and everyone feels overwhelmed a lot of the time. That's especially true this semester. Um, if they feel overwhelmed, it doesn't mean they don't belong in the field. It means they're working on hard problems. Uh, tell students about your mistakes. I share with them an article that I wrote about mine. In the picture on the right, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, if people learned from their mistakes, I must have a master's degree by now. And I point out that I have a PhD. I've made even more mistakes. Throughout the semester, admit your mistakes and reward students for finding and reporting them. A lot of professors get annoyed when students point out their mistakes, but I think this sends out the wrong message. 
uh, at choosing a good project. At first, I had students work on App Inventor because I knew my old colleagues would answer their questions and review their PRs quickly. Now I let students choose projects. They should make sure there have been recent updates to the project. If no code has been pushed in years, the changes are unlikely to be incorporated. I tell them to look for active and friendly developer communities. Often these are on Discord and students can see how people are treated before posting. They should look for a project that's welcoming to newcomers as shown on the forums or contributor guidelines Specifically, they should look whether pull requests get reviewed promptly. If not, their changes might languish. Choosing a project is usually easier than selecting an issue. I advise them to look at labels such as good first issue or beginner friendly, not to choose high priority issues, which are likely to get fixed quickly by a more experienced developer, they should know that some issues they see, especially feature requests, might be considered invalid by the maintainers. They should discuss issues with maintainers to make sure they want someone working on the issue and if they have any ideas how they should do so. And they should explicitly claim the issue. Above all, they should be prepared to start over with a new issue if theirs gets fixed by someone else, made obsolete, or proves too difficult. Here's an example from a previous year where a developer said, oops, I accidentally fixed your issue. And um, I won't show you what was said behind the scenes, but um, the student showed good grace and switched to another issue. Some useful techniques for running the class have teams of two to three students per issue with everyone in the class working on the same code base. Uh, weekly meetings of one to two hours. That way you can make sure students stay on track and help them with anything they get stuck on. Maintain a Slack server where students can ask you and each other for questions and share information and always be willing to help students draft messages. A big challenge is getting a handle on large code bases. Something I do is create static UML static class diagrams to help learn my way around a project. I've had students do this, although I'm not sure it's been helpful. What is helpful is having them step through code in a debugger. Um, here are some of the projects students have worked on. Kate Feeney and Trevor Adams made contributes, contributions to App Inventor, which led to their master's thesis. Kate went on to do the Google Summer of Code with App Inventor. Um, Trevor wrote about the experience. Most homework assignments in CS classes either start from scratch or build on top of straightforward code and require relatively simple interactions with an existing API. In contrast, App Inventor was an ongoing project with many contributors, a sizable code base, elements that were deprecated, elements that were in progress, and elements that hooked into other code bases. It was the first time I really had to understand and work with a large amount of code written by someone other than myself, figuring which parts I needed to deal with and how they worked, and just as importantly, figuring out which parts I could safely ignore. These are skills that are crucial for working on real software development projects, and it made me a lot more comfortable when I had my first industry experience and was faced with the same situation. Knowing that I could understand and successfully modify real deployed code gave me a lot of confidence in myself as a programmer. I, I had students working on AMP Inventor again in 2014. Here's what Colin Lockhart, now finishing his PhD at University of Washington wrote. Working on App Inventor was also my first experience using a real build system with complex dependencies that didn't always compile correctly. 
In fact, if I recall correctly, my first week or so on that project was largely spent on Stack Overflow trying to resolve some issues to uh, competing, relate to competing C compilers. Not the most exciting work, but very educational. When I later went off to NASA for an internship, I arrived to find a group of other interns struggling with build problems. And I felt like a superhero when I was able to immediately help them make progress. In 2016, Kate Manning and Emily Kager added an extension to App Inventor. Both went on to work for Mozilla, Kate through Outreachy, Emily is an intern and then full-time employee. I'll let her use her own words. Hi, I'm Emily Kager. I'm an Android engineer and full-time maintainer of Firefox for Android. Uh, I actually got my first taste of open source in Ellen's graduate section of class where we contributed a new feature to MIT App Inventor. Uh, as part of Ellen's class, my partner and I designed and wrote a new feature for MIT App Inventor called Chartmaker, um, in which you could draw charts using the little like widgets. <laughs> um, and we learned some really core open source skills, like setting up our dev environment for the first time, posting questions and communicating with the maintainers, and writing documentation for our new feature. Hi. Whoops. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, in 2019, students chose to contribute to an app that some of them use, Habitica. This fall, I'm teaching a Java development course. This is my first time supervising open source in a non-Android environment. I wasn't able to find many active projects in Java except for Minecraft, which students are thrilled to work on. They chose to contribute to Essentials X, one of the most popular plugins. Um, here are some conclusions. The benefits um, of working on open source are working with production code bases and tools, learning how to communicate online in professional settings, solving real world problems with actual users. That seems like a better use of time than writing code no one will use feeling like real developers and having support, both technical and psychological throughout the process. Some challenges, there may be unpleasant surprises, even more than with regular assignments you create. This requires a lot of faculty time. I've worked with two to eight students at a time. I don't know if it can be scaled to large courses. There have been problems with students who didn't feel like they belonged on a team with other students because of their demographic differences. Even if the other teammates don't discriminate, which can be hard for an outside person to tell, students' reasonable fear of discrimination can get in the way. Some students, even graduate students, need more structure and drop the course or avoid doing the work. Key points to communicate to students are participating in open source makes you part of a large and important movement. Even a small contribution is a big deal and may take all semester. You can still be successful if your PR can't be merged. Most people will be helpful and welcoming and you're not on your own. I think in that, so I can take questions. I'm gonna skip the last student uh, clip. I said, skip the last student clip. Ah, and go, go straight to questions and comments if there's any more time. We might have time for one question, but then we need, um, we are on a tight little schedule here, so we need to hop to the next one soon. Does anybody have questions they'd like to pop in the chat or the Q&A? Um, do I believe some of these aspects can be applied to a real dev team? Well, I'd say the most important part is providing a lot of support and letting people know that if they feel overwhelmed, um, that that's normal. Um, so, so yes, and making sure that back, holes in their background get filled. 